On March 15th, 2018, at roughly 1.46 p.m., the under-construction pedestrian bridge outside FIU collapsed in seconds. About 950 tons of concrete and steel dropped onto active traffic in broad daylight, killing six people. It made international headlines, but what still doesn't sit right is this. The bridge wasn't even open yet, and it was carrying essentially its own weight when it collapsed. Today, I'm in South Florida, standing at the same crossing, where a new bridge is rising in the long shadow of what unfolded here. We're going to lay out how a project meant to protect students and locals turned into a complete engineering failure, and how the replacement is being built to make sure this road never becomes a disaster site again. Just off of Florida International University's campus, Southwest 8th Street cuts through the area running alongside the Tamiami Canal. It's a wide, fast arterial, eight lanes at the crossing with 109th Avenue, that sits directly between the university and the rapidly growing University City District where many students live. The project's basic purpose was to separate pedestrians and cyclists from traffic and provide a direct, reliable connection between campus and housing north of the road, instead of pushing thousands of daily crossings through a high-volume intersection. To do that, the original pedestrian bridge aimed to be both infrastructure and a statement piece. Structurally, it was a single plane reinforced concrete truss, a 175 foot long main span where the deck and canopy were part of the truss system. The full concept also included a 109 foot tall pylon at the north end and 10 inclined steel pipe stays intended to dampen vibration, while also delivering a cable stayed look once the rest of the system was completed. In its final configuration, the bridge was planned as two spans, the 175 foot main span over the roadway and a 90 nine foot backspan over the canal for a total length of 274 feet. Rather than building over live traffic, the main span was assembled adjacent to the highway and then rolled into place in one piece on March 10th, 2018. The 950 ton move onto permanent support was fast, precise, and designed to minimize disruption. But that milestone also locked the structure into a critical intermediate state. After the move, the main span was only supported at two points and effectively behaved as a single span concrete truss carrying its own self weight. Without the stabilizing effects the designers ultimately intended. At that moment, the backspan, the upper pylon, and the stay cables were not yet built, meaning the bridge was operating in an incomplete structural configuration, where it's especially sensitive to design assumptions. The truss layout itself compounded the risk. A single plane truss means the diagonals and verticals sit in one plane down the deck centerline. No parallel second truss, no alternate load path if a critical connection degrades. Finally, the way the concrete was built introduced another layer of complexity. The span was cast in three stages, deck first, then the truss members, then the canopy, which created seams between pores. Those seams had to carry large forces using friction and rebar, and that only works if the joint is prepared correctly. Within just five days of the span being set in place, those consequences became irreversible. At the moment of failure, crews were actively performing operations, specifically retensioning the internal post-tensioning rods in member 11 near the North Pier. This was not routine adjustment. It was response to major cracking that had been observed and documented. Despite that, the roadway beneath the span was not fully closed. Only two of the eight total lanes were shut down. In the collapse, the North End let go first, with the canopy and deck dropping almost straight down near the pylon pier. The South End briefly rotated about its support before the remaining structure fell. Importantly, the support piers remained standing. The collapse was driven by failure within the truss system itself. Think of the bridge in its partially completed state like a big concrete truss whose forces all had to turn the corner through one key joint at the north end, where the diagonal member met the deck. That diagonal pushes into the deck at an angle, so it doesn't just push down, it also pushes sideways, trying to make the joint slide apart. The problem is that the joint was a seam between concrete pores, so it relied on friction and steel rebar to keep it from slipping. The design overestimated how much that seam could resist sliding, so it started cracking and slipping under the bridge's own weight. And because the bridge had basically one main load path, once that one joint failed, there wasn't a backup to carry the load, so the entire span came down. The NTSB also identified process failures that amplified the outcome, an inadequate independent peer review that did not catch the node deficiency, and a broad failure to halt work and close the roadway in the face of severe documented cracking. During removal of temporary support in the casting yard, a crack was observed in the member 
November 11-12 nodal region weeks before placement, indicating that the node was overstressed as soon as the span began carrying more of its self-weight. After the span was moved into place on March 10th, the cracking at the north end worsened sharply. By March 13th, the construction engineering firm photographed and reported large, deep cracks far beyond normal reinforced concrete cracking. The team escalated the issue to the designer, Fig. Fig's engineer of record repeatedly maintained that the cracks were not a safety concern and could be addressed with repairs. If you follow my channel, you've probably heard of the firm Fig before. They were also responsible for Houston's 2019 Ship Channel Bridge fiasco, where a design flaw forced the entire project to be paused. And this is not to mention the Harbor Bridge project in Corpus Christi, where Fig-related design errors also occurred, pausing construction. But enough about what happened, let's talk about the bridge being built today. For years after the collapse, the leftover support columns from the original project stood as visible reminders of the failure, but the underlying problem that drove the bridge in the first place didn't go away. The rebuild effort restarted under a very different governance model. In May of 2020, the Florida Department of Transportation announced it would take over the design and construction of the new bridge. FIU would remain a stakeholder and ultimately the owner-operator, but FDOT would manage delivery and coordinate with the NTSB, so the new project incorporated the investigation's findings and recommendations. In September of 2021, remaining remnants from the failed bridge were demolished to fully clear the site. By May 2022, FDOT unveiled the selected concept for the new bridge. The most important design decision was philosophical, avoid experimental structural systems. Officials were blunt that the replacement would prioritize proven bridge engineering over novelty. Structurally, the new bridge shifts from a single plane concrete truss to a steel girder superstructure, specifically two steel box girders running the length of the span, supporting a concrete deck. That choice matters for two reasons. First, steel box girders are a well-understood primary system with predictable behavior under dead load, live load, wind, and thermal effects. Second, two girders inherently add redundancy. If one component is compromised, the remaining load path can still carry significant load. Geometrically, the replacement still spans the same roadway, but it's planned to be longer, roughly 290 feet overall, to accommodate broader approach geometry and user circulation. The deck will be wider, especially over the canal side, where the bridge can support seating and gathering zones. A continuous canopy is also included as a feature, but in this version, it's not the primary structural top element of a truss. It's only for shading and weather protection. The bridge includes 150 foot tall twin pylons and draped cables. Cables. These cables provide additional and redundant support and stabilization, so the bridge doesn't rely on these cables for primary gravity support, but they can help if necessary. Construction sequencing is also intentionally different. Instead of another one-piece accelerated move, FDOT is building the replacement in place in conventional stages, as you might be able to tell. That approach increases the number of traffic impacts, but it also enables stricter safety controls. FDOT is targeting full completion by early 2027, and from what I could see in mid-December 2025, work at least appears to be tracking with that time. The key lesson from this project is the critical importance of peer review, not only of the final design, but also through the intermediate stages of construction. The bridge now represents more than a way for students to get across the road. It's a second chance after a failure that never should have happened, and a test whether the people rebuilding it can deliver something safe, dependable, and worth trusting for decades. I'm Josh, this is Bill Gore. thanks for watching.